as usual, we need to pick up the pace a little bit. And so uh, there are parts of, for the next, next hour session that we're going we're gonna to fly through. There are parts that we will camp out on. Um, but again, the goal is to give you, give you as much as possible tonight that you can go back and, and walk through individually, small group, uh, in, anything along those lines. So hopefully it will be helpful toward that end. Um, so we've, we've looked at definition of the church. Now I want us to dive in and see description of the church. It's just these, these multiple ways, images that we see and how they come together in some different ways. So sometimes when the, ch- the Bible's talking about the church, it's talking about it one way, and other times it's talking about it in a totally different way. So flying through this here, but the church is universal and local. This is important. We see both in the church. We see the church meeting in a house. We see the church meeting in a city. We see the church meeting in a region, church in the world. And so we see both of these pictures in Scripture, universal and local. But what I want to make sure to emphasize, the dominant emphasis in the New Testament is on the local church. Out of the 114 times ecclesia is mentioned in the New Testament, at least 90 of them at least 90 of them refer to specific local gatherings of believers. So almost all the time that New Testament is referring to the church, it's talking about local churches. The local church is a clear expression of the universal body of Christ. And we're going to talk about in just a second whether or not it's important to be committed to one local church. Or if it's okay, well, I'm just a part of the universal church. We're going to talk about that in a second. But feel the weight of this right here. The dominant emphasis in the New Testament is on, it's on local churches. So the church is both universal and local. The church is both visible and invisible. Visible and invisible. What I mean by that, invisible church, the church as God sees it from heaven. The Lord knows who are His, 2 Timothy 2 says. So that's, that's all true believers. The reality is, though, visible church, the church is we see it on earth. So we identify ourselves in different churches. But the visible church includes some false believers. And you see Paul warning about this in Acts 20. He's talking about some in 2 Timothy 2. About false believers who come in who, have not, who are not truly followers of Christ but are part of the church. Augustine said, many sheep are without and many wolves are within. So the, so the picture is only God really knows who is in, I'm talking about universal church here. We, we come together in churches and, and it's important that we, we guard what we, what we say, who we say is in the church. We're going to talk about that in a second, why that's important. But still it's not going to be perfect. The church includes both New Testament believers and Old Testament believers. Now some would debate this and I think part of it would be semantics. But when you take the definition that we're using for church, the church as the body of God's, a body of people called by God's grace through faith in Christ to glorify Him by serving Him in this world, that would include both New Testament and Old Testament. We see evidence of Old Testament gatherings even referred to in the New Testament. And we see examples of Old Testament faith. You say, well, what about, you know, called by God's grace grace through faith in Christ? That Old Testament believers believe in Christ? Well, look at, look at Hebrews 11, verse 26, talking about Moses. Moses considered the reproach of Christ or suffering for Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. That was Moses linked here to Christ. The rest of Hebrews 11 and then Hebrews 12 talks about how, how Old Testament believers were looking forward. You've got, I've got it here. Key difference is Old Testament believers trusted in the coming Christ. Sure, they didn't know all the details and they don't... They didn't know all that we know now. But they were looking forward to the promise that had been given all the way back in Genesis, fulfillment of the promise that had been given all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. So they trusted in the coming Christ. New Testament believers trust in the crucified Christ, looking, looking back to the cross. They were looking forward to the cross. We look back to the cross. Old Testament believers are ethnically distinct. In other words, for the most part, with a few exceptions, Old Testament people were the Jewish people, the people of Israel. New Testament believers are ethnically diverse. And so we see that's one of the huge things that we see all over the New Testament letters is the, and in the book of Acts, the bringing together of Jewish and Gentile, Jews and Gentiles together into the church. 
Old Testament believers are required to circumcise their male offspring. New Testament believers, oh, sorry, I skipped one. Old Testament believers lived, jumped right to the circumcision. So anyway, uh, <laughs> Old Testament believers, just wanted to get through that, but I need to wait. Old Testament believers, we don't, we don't need to spend any more time there, lived under their own government with God-given laws. New Testament believers live among the rulers of the nations. So the reality is we're not a theocracy anymore like we see a theocracy, a, a rule under God-given laws, Old Testament people of God, even God as their king, then God-designated kings, um, different in the New Testament. We live among the rulers of the nations. Old Testament believers are required to circumcise their male offspring. New Testament believers are required to baptize all believers. So there are some key differences there and, and key distinctions but there is some continuity there between Old Testament and New Testament believers, which we'll talk about in just a second with Israel. The church includes, we just talked about this, both Jews and Gentiles brought together. That was a picture of the gospel. It was the mystery of Christ bringing Jews and Gentiles together. The church is unified and diversified. We've talked about that. We work for unity in the local church. We see unity and, and we see that that prayed for by Christ and that longed for all over. It's, it's the agony in Paul's voice in 1 Corinthians 1 when he's saying, oh, you're so divided. And division is dangerous. Paul says, watch out for those who cause divisions. They're devoid of the Spirit, Jude 1.19 says. Division is dangerous and division is deadly. Listen to this, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. Like you see what it's listed with. Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If someone is being divisive in the church, now there's a picture in which we stand on truth and if falsehood is being proclaimed in the church, then we are responsible for standing up to that and, and not, not tolerating that, which we'll see in Galatians chapter 1. But the reality is we need to promote the unity of the church. Division is dangerous and deadly. We work for unity in local church and universal church. What about the church and its relationship to Israel? And this could be a, a whole other secret church right here, maybe one day, but think about the church and the Israel of God. Galatians 6, Paul uses this phrase, upon the Israel of God. And in Romans 2, he talks about how, how the Jewish people were, were not Jewish by outward circumstances as much as by inward faith. And so I want, you to, I want you to think about how the church is referred to in relationship to Israel. The church has talked about we are descendants of Israel's father, Abraham. Romans 4, Romans 9. So we're descendants of Israel's father, Abraham. We are heirs of Israel, Israel's promise. You are Christ and you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to his promise. The promise that was given him, passed on to us, Romans chapter 4, and an incredible passage right there. We are recipients of Israel's blessings. This passage, and we've already referred to it a couple of times in 1 Peter chapter 2, uses so much imagery that it was for Israel in the Old Testament. Priesthood, sacrifices, living stones, Chief cornerstone, royal priesthood, holy nation, people for the possession of God. Talking about the New Testament. So, the reality is the story of the church ultimately begins with Israel, with the Old Testament people of God. So there's not necessarily this perfect exact identity between the church and Israel, but there is clearly continuity between what we see in Israel and then what we see happening in the church. More that we could talk about there maybe one day. The church and the kingdom of God. What about, the, is, the, is the church the same as the kingdom? And the answer is no, the church is not the kingdom. Church and kingdom are not synonymous in Scripture. They're very closely related, but not synonymous. You look through these passages I put there in Acts, you would not put church where you see kingdom here. We don't preach good news about the church of God. We don't persuade them about the church of God. Um, proclaim the church well, we'll see my face again. It's not, it's not the picture. So what we see in the New Testament is the kingdom creates the church. As the kingdom of God is proclaimed, the reign of God, the rule of God, and the people under his reign and his rule, we come into the kingdom of God and the church is created. That's the picture we see. And I put some references there from, from Jesus' words in Matthew. In turn, the church ends up proclaiming the kingdom then. So 
The church kingdom creates the church, and then the church proclaims the kingdom. This gospel of the kingdom is preached from the church. The church is the instrument of the kingdom. That the kingdom is advancing through the church. The church is the guardian of the kingdom. When Jesus is talking to his disciples, and especially Peter in Matthew 16, about the kingdom of God, he says, I will give you the key, keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is the picture of the church being entrusted as a guardian of the kingdom. Two closing truths, church and kingdom. Jesus will return for his church. The king is coming back for his church. And when he does, he will consummate his kingdom. His kingdom, his rule, his reign will be asserted once and for all and finally. So that's just a brief description of the church. Some things that I think are important in the conversation. We didn't, we didn't camp out on a lot there. Okay, now devotion to the church. What does Scripture say about how much or how little Christians should devote themselves to the church? And is that, should we devote ourselves to a local church? Or is it just we need to be devoted to all Christians everywhere in the universal church? One of the most common questions here is, is church membership necessary? Let's, on a plane the other day with a guy who said, church membership, nowhere in the Bible. I'm not a member of a church. This guy said, I'm a follower of Christ, um, but not a member of a church because that's just a man-made thing, this membership thing. And this is where I, I would grant clearly that membership in a local church is not biblically commanded. You won't find anywhere in the Bible where the word membership, church membership, is even mentioned. You won't find a command for believers to become a member of a local church. And so for many people, that, that just seals the, the deal. But we need to be careful. There's also not a place where Jesus explicitly says the words, I am God. There's also not a place where we see the Trinity specifically outlined in Scripture in the kind of terms that we're looking for here. So let's not throw it out the window just yet. I would put before us tonight that membership in a local church is biblically implied, understood, now, I want, I want to be careful here. Even with this word membership, I think it's the best word. I, I don't know of a better word to describe because what we're talking about is as a body. And there are parts and there are members of a body. Now, people say, well, yes, we're just members of the universal body of Christ. But I want you to think about four ways that the Bible implies church membership in a local church and why it's important. Number one, membership is implied by church gatherings. When we see this word ecclesia, the church of God in Corinth, the church that meets in Aquila and Priscilla's house, 1 Corinthians 16. That's where 90 of the 114 references to ecclesia come in the New Testament, to a gathering in a place. And followers of Christ belong to one of those gatherings. When Paul writes to the church in Corinth, that's a that's a certain defined people. He's not writing, although obviously the implications there are in Scripture and they're for all of us, but this was a letter written to a local church at a specific time in a specific place, a specific gathering of believers. And so it begs the question, as a Christian, what gathering are you a part of? With what church do you gather? Membership is implied here that you are a part, member, whatever you want to call it, you are identified with a gathering of believers. Some people say, well, I gather with all kinds of churches. I go to a different one every Sunday. So I could, I could get all the different letters, and it's all the better. I'm in this church, and this church, and this church. Well, okay, second. Membership is implied by church discipline. Now, we're going to talk about church discipline later on. But when Jesus talks about confronting a brother in sin, listen to how he relates it to the church. He says in verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. So you confront a brother in his sin. If that doesn't work, you take two or three others along. And then if that doesn't work, if he refuses to listen, tell it to the church. So who is, who is the church there? The universal body of Christ? All right, bro over here is unrepentant in his sin, so announce it to the entire universal body of Christ that this guy is unrepentant. No. This is clearly, tell it to uh, the gathering of believers, the 
local church. You get to 1 Corinthians 5, which we'll also talk about with church discipline. And basically Paul talks about excommunicating someone from the church. And we'll talk about what, what's going on there in, in a little bit. But the reality is, in order to be excommunicated, taken out of the church, you got to be what first? In the church. you got to be a member of the church. And apparently it was a big deal to not be a member of the church, to be basically kicked out of the church, sent out from among them. How would it be possible to do what Jesus, Paul, are talking about here if, if you weren't defined as a member of a church in the first place, identified with a gathering? Third, membership is implied by church leadership. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. That's a command for Christians in the Bible. Now again, this is something we're going to talk about later, but think about this for a second. Leaders, they will give an account. So, so leaders in a church will give an account for those whom they lead. So I'm a pastor of a church. Who do I give an account for? Who will I give an account for? Every person in the universal body of Christ? Am I responsible for pastoring, shepherding, and accounting to God for every single Christian on the face of the planet? Or in all time? No. I'm responsible for the church that I pastor, the gathering, the people. Now, obey your leaders. Submit to them. That's a command. So followers of Christ in this room are commanded to obey the leaders in the church. Now, who does that mean that you obey? Every single Christian that's out there? Turn on TV, you got somebody, well, whatever he says, I got to do it. No, no, you obey the leaders of the church that you're identified with. This whole accounting language, being shepherd over a flock, Acts 20, 1 Peter chapter 5. The reality is you, you're not supposed to obey just any Christian leader. We're going to talk about what this means, obeying leaders, submitting to leaders. And, and I'm not supposed to be accountable for every single person in the universal body of Christ. That totally implies a local church. Next, last implication, church membership is implied by church accountability. You look at these passages below. And you see God holding the church accountable for choosing leaders in Acts chapter 6. They're supposed to choose leaders among them. The church is accountable for preaching the gospel in Galatians chapter 1. If they're not, if somebody's not preaching the gospel, the church is accountable for shutting them up. The church is accountable for identifying members. That's pictured in 1 Corinthians 5. It's interesting the church is the one who defines who's a member in 1 Corinthians 5, not the individual. The church defines that. The church is accountable for sending missionaries in Acts chapter 13. And so all these passages, you put them together, they beg the question from every follower of Christ in this room. Are you accountable? Are you an accountable member of a local church? And I'm not just saying, is your name somewhere on a roll? Do you attend somewhere? I'm saying, who is your life committed to? What body, what gathering of believers are you committed to? Being with, spurring on, holding fast to the hope of God with, Hebrews chapter 10. Who were the leaders that your life is in submission to, who are accountable for your spiritual growth? And if you can't answer that question, the reality is you are living contrary to the pattern of the New Testament. I know, I know that's, that's not particularly popular today, but, but it's, it's what's in Scripture. Guys, this is important. Local church, for all these different reasons, God's designed it this way for our good and for His glory. Don't, we don't shop and just hop around from church to church, and we certainly don't ignore the church altogether. That's not an option. There's, there's no New Testament believers, there's no believers in the New Testament who are not associated with a church, with a local gathering of believers. So my encouragement is if, if you are here tonight and you are not committed to a local gathering of believers, that you would walk out of here tonight with a firm commitment to make, make that a priority in your Christian life, to leave your ways behind and follow his ways. And, and doesn't, 
terminology, whether it's called membership or this or that, the, 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 it's much bigger than that. This is a commitment of your life to a gathering of believers. That's church membership. What about a church covenant? That's, that's a discussion. We have a, a church covenant here at, at Brook Hills. I, that, again, not in Scripture. There's not a command to it. There's not a prohibition against it either. So we have asked, is it valuable? Definitions of covenant defined, just a kind of a secular definition of covenant or written agreement or promise, usually under seal between two or more parties, especially for the performance of some action. So church covenant defined, and this is... Uh, this is certainly not a divine definition. This is a David Platt definition. A clear expression of a church's commitment to love one another as a community of faith. And basically we've said as a church here that, that we want to. There's so much in Scripture. I mean, from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, about what it means to be the people of God. And so we wanted to make sure to remind ourselves clearly, biblically, hey, what does it mean for us to really be committed to one another? And it's something we celebrate together. It's not some legalistic... Uh, uh, code that you have to abide by. It's just us saying, hey, we want to love one another in these different ways. I think we see foundations for that in the Old Testament. You look at Nehemiah 9, 38. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. I'm not talking about, this is not on the level of Mosaic covenant, Abrahamic covenant, new covenant, now I'm adding another covenant or we're adding another covenant. Not at all. This is just a relationship with one another. And then you look in Hebrews and Nehemiah chapter 9, we're not going to spend time here, but the church is a community grounded in the Word of God. So this doesn't in any way replace the Word of God by any means. The Word is central. It forms the foundation for our commitment to love one another. The church is a community sustained by the grace of God. You see that in Nehemiah 9, just a confession of in the people of God of their need for God. The church is a community promoting the good of one another. The whole covenant that they affix their names and seals to is, is for how they're going to spur one another on, how they're going to love one another. And then the church is a community demonstrating the glory of God. What I did at the, at the end of that section is I just put it illust as an illustration, uh, our church covenant as the church at Brook Hills. Um, feel free, if that's any help to you in any way, feel free to use it however you want. But it just, it's a picture of what I mean when I talk about church covenant. I don't think that that is essential because we don't, we don't see it commanded anywhere in Scripture. I do think it's valuable. I do think it's valuable, especially when it comes to this, summary of the church. What is the church? So we use this definition. The church is a body of people called by God's grace through faith in Christ to glorify Him by serving Him in this world. What is a local church? The local church is a local body, a gathering of believers in Christ, covenanted together to glorify God by serving Him in this world. Now here's why I want to emphasize that. By that I don't mean that in order to be a local church you have to have a church covenant. But this word, I just don't know a better word to describe how when, when you have a gathering of believers and they have said, they have identified themselves as a church. So this is, this is why Matthew 18, well, where two or three are gathered, there you've got a church. As long as you've got Christians in the plural, you got a church. No. That's total abuse of Matthew 18. And it misses the point. The church is a gathering of believers, but not just sitting down having coffee together. The church is a gathering that is committed to one another, that is committed to loving each other and caring for each other and spurring each other on toward Christ and doing all the activities we're about to walk through, they do together and they identify themselves as a church and they align themselves with what God's Word says is the church. And so when you've got a local body of believers that gathers together, and we see this popping up all over the book of Acts, we see instructions and acts, acts and the, the New Testament letters. As believers gather together, they identify themselves with each other and they commit to each other and they grow together and they give themselves to the mission of God together. They worship together. They're baptized together. That's what's happening in a local, local church. That's what I mean by covenanted together. So Christians in local churches, as followers of Christ, we commit our lives to one another as a member, as a part of, of a local church. For the good of ourselves, if you live the Christian life, try to live the Christian life, apart from the local church, you will starve spiritually. And you will live contrary to the New Testament. It's not good. The New Testament knows nothing of Christianity disconnected from local churches. God says it's a priority. Now it's not, 
perfect. Obviously, local churches aren't perfect. And the reason why they're not perfect is because you're in it. <laughs> and I'm in it. And that's why they're not perfect. And it's not going to be perfect when you get there. It's going to be worse. Because <laughs> you're a sinner and you're adding one more to the mix. But God is gracious, right? And that's the whole picture of the church. Like, it's why the, this is the announcement of his glory. Like, only God could take that group, group of people and make something good out of it. Like, that's the point. So, for the good of ourselves, for the good of other Christians, you need other Christians, and they need you. They don't need to just sit next to you in a worship service either. They need you to commit your life to them. And they need you to commit your life to them. You say, well, what about, what about people outside the church? If we're all committed to each other, no, this is the beauty. We join the church. We're part of a local church for the good of non-Christians. Because God's design in the church is to create a loving community that will be a dis- public display of the gospel to the world. A community that shows the difference that Christ makes and that draws people to Christ by our love for one another. The world is not drawn to Christ by seeing casual, anonymous church attenders everywhere. It doesn't do it. The world is drawn to Christ when they see people sacrificing their lives in love for each other and committed to each other in a way they don't see in any other place in the world. That's God's design. So do that for the good of non-Christians and ultimately for the glory of God. Let me, let me just ask this question, and, and hopefully if you're not convinced, <laughs> this will convince you. Like, how will we display the glory of the one who died for the church if we devote nothing to the church? Do it for your good and for the good of others who need you and for the good of the lost who need to see Christ in the church and do it for the glory of God. Okay, so what does the church do? God's design for his people. What I want to do is I want to define seven core activities of the church and use this passage, Acts 2, 38 through 47, as a foundation. So I want to read this. This is right after. Okay, so Jesus has died on the cross. He's risen from the grave. In Acts chapter 1, he ascends into heaven. And in Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, he sends the Spirit. Peter starts preaching. And you get to the end of his sermon. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. See this this picture we've already talked about. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. This is the inauguration of the New Testament church, church in the New Testament. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling, all their, possess- selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So I want us to take that one passage, and I want to show you seven essential activities of the church. When it comes down to, okay, biblically, you try to throw aside traditions and preferences what is necessary for the church to do. The church evangelizes, baptizes, teaches, nurtures, worships, prays, and multiplies. And the bulk of the rest of our time together tonight is going to be spent on those seven. We're just going to walk through them one by one. So let's start with the church evangelizes. And this, this whole reality starts in Acts chapter 1. It all starts, the church beholds the glory of Christ. And really, not just Acts chapter 1, but the Great Commission text in Matthew and Mark and Luke. Acts chapter 1, so Jesus is with them. And they they thought he had died. He rises from the grave and they think, yes. But then here in Acts chapter 1, 
It says in verse 9, when they had said these things, they were looking on. He was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? Well, clearly, that's a rhetorical question. (laughs) You've just seen a man launch into the sky. Like, you look up. (laughs) It's a great question. This Jesus, here's the promise that's set up by the rhetorical question. This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So this is where it all starts. They see Jesus. He's the risen Savior, the exalted Lord, and the coming King. And this vision, don't miss it. This vision is going to drive them from here on out to the rest of the book of Acts. And should drive the church today and until He comes back in the same way he went into heaven. Passion for the kingdom is fueled by passion for the king. The church is fueled by passion for the king. This is what I love about Daniel 7, which prophesied the Son of Man would come, be given authority, dominion, rule and reign. And then you get to Stephen, first Christian martyr, he's being stoned, and he looks up, and he sees glory of God and Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. And Stephen gives us life. Why? Oh, because he's gripped by the glory of the king. And this is it. This is why we do what we do in church. This is why we evangelize. Now, I know that's not a popular word. In some, this is why we tell good news. This is why we Proclaim the gospel. This is why everybody in the church proclaims the gospel. Why? Because every because there are people all over Birmingham and people all over the cities and communities where you live that do not know Jesus as Savior and King, and He deserves every single one of their glory. That's why we tell them. And it's why we don't stop there. It's why we go to Africa because there's 3,000 animistic tribes in Africa that are worshiping all kinds of different spirits and gods and there's only one king who's worthy of all their worship. And so we go tell them in Africa and we go to Japan and Laos and Vietnam because there's 350 million Buddhists in those countries who are following Buddha's rules and Buddha's regulations and Buddha's not king, Jesus is king. And he deserves their praise. And this is why we go to India and Pakistan and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and Maldives and Nepal because there's 950 million Hindus in those countries that are following more gods than you or I can even fathom. And not one of those gods is true. There's only one king who's true and he deserves all their praise. It's why we go there. It's why we go to communist nations like China or Laos or North Korea or Cuba because there's over a billion people in those nations that have grown up in atheistic philosophies that completely deny the existence of God. And there is a God. His name is Jesus and he reigns as king. And they need to know that. And this is why we go to the tough places in the world. It's why we go to 1.3, some say 1.7 billion Muslims in the world because they are fasting and giving alms, making holy pilgrimages to Mecca and praying five times a day to a false God. And Jesus has died on the cross. He's risen from the grave. He's coming back. And he's the only one who deserves their praise. And when the church believes... We're not going to get anywhere tonight if I keep stopping like this. But the reality is when the church believes that, then we will give our lives to make this gospel known. When the church believes that, then we won't sit back and like, well, I want more comforts. No. We've got a king who deserves praise from every people group on the planet. So the church says, yes, we give our lives to preach in the gospel. We're not silent. The church proclaims the gospel of Christ. We behold his glory and we proclaim his gospel. Spirit comes upon, spirit will come upon you, Jesus says, and you will be witnesses. Key word, witness. To witness is to speak, to testify, to proclaim. People say, well, I witness with my life. Who was it? Preach the gospel, who said, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. Well, it sounds cute, but it's not true. Like, you can't preach the gospel just by being nice. Like, Jesus didn't say, spirit will come upon you, and you will be kind Well, yes, be kind. Hopefully it's a given. 
I've, if you're a witness, you speak. Our brothers and sisters are not in prison right now in Central Asia because they went out and smiled and did a good deed. They're in prison in Central Asia because they're preaching the gospel. So let us not sit back and say, well, I just witnessed with my life. Undercut the whole point here. Or, God, we've got to move on. But this, this is key. I witness when the Holy Spirit leads me. Okay, grain of truth to that. Yes, we want to be led by the Holy Spirit. But here's the deal. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be a witness. Okay. This is good. So you can now consider yourself led. <laughs> if you have the Spirit of God in you, then this is great. You don't have to wait for a tingly feeling to go down your spine and some weird feeling to come upon you and be like, I guess something supernatural is happening. No, you live with the supernatural in you. And he's in you for one purpose, to be a witness. So speak because he has led. Okay, and that's what happened. That's what happened. When the spirit came down, they started talking. They start talking in all these different tongues and languages. And then Peter stands up and he preaches. The church proclaims the gospel and the power of Jesus' presence. Oh, I love this. Who's preaching the first Christian sermon? It's the disciple with the foot-shaped mouth. It's Peter. Like he always said the wrong thing. Always. Always. And so Jesus, I love this. I love this. In Luke 24, it's why he said... Stay in the city until you've been clothed with fire. We're not like, Peter, the last thing this world needs is you going out there without my spirit in you. So just stay put until my spirit comes on you. And then when you've got me in you, okay, just talk all you want. And so he does. He preaches. Oh, think about it. Not just Peter, us. He is with us. It's his promise in the Great Commission. He dwells in us. That's why we do, John 14, greater works than Christ. What? Are we really going to do greater works than Christ? Yes. Think about it. Christ, one man on the earth, anointed and filled with the Spirit of God. And he sends to heaven and he sends the Spirit to anoint and fill all of his fathers. So that right now, all over the world, the Spirit of God is empowering the proclamation of the gospel in different countries and different villages. And people are coming to Christ right now. And people are being, being delivered from sin and struggle. Right now, because the Spirit's at work. Oh, when we leave this place, that's 3,000 people that have gathered tonight. Like, Followers of Christ with the Spirit and all of us. He enables our obedience, which has been promised in Ezekiel 36. I will give a new spirit in you, give you life, Ezekiel 37. And he empowers our proclamation. <coughs> we announce the good news. And I just put in here, we'll, we'll fly through this, not that we need to fly through the gospel, but we've talked about this at a previous secret church. Um, I just put a, a, a simple description that that I have used, we have used around here, of the gospel. And the, the reality is, so the church just doesn't just speak. The church speaks a certain message. The just and gracious God of the universe has looked upon hopelessly sinful men in their rebellion. And he has sent his son, God in the flesh, to bear his wrath against sin on the cross, to show his power over sin in the resurrection, so that everyone who believes in him, trusts in him as Lord and King, will be reconciled to God forever. So when we speak, we tell people what I, we call gospel threads, the character of God. We tell people about who God is. We tell people about the sinfulness of man. Now, that's, that's not popular. Like you give a cup of cold water, you get applauded in the world. You tell men they're sinful and condemned before God. You don't get applauded by men anymore. So give the cup of cold water. But don't deceive them by keeping the truth back as well. The sufficiency of Christ, we talk about his life and his death and his resurrection. The necessity of faith, we call people to trust 
and the urgency of eternity, we tell people, turn, trust in Christ. Eternity is dependent on this. Gospel threads and gospel testimonies. In the context of our lives, 1 Peter 3 says, be prepared to tell about the hope that's in you. And when the church proclaims that gospel, God awakens people's hearts. I love Acts 13. This is just one example of many. When Acts 2, people were cut to the heart when they heard Peter preach. Acts 13, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. You see the passive there again. They were appointed to eternal life. God was doing this. Oh, I was a couple weeks ago in Southeast Asia, less than two weeks ago, largest unevangelized island on the earth, preached the gospel one night in this, in this gathering. It was mostly followers of Christ, but some non-believers had come. And so preached the gospel. And I'll be honest, like I preached and it was like finished and it's like, well, that was definitely not the A game. Uh, like it just, it, it never felt like it was really connecting or going well. It preached the gospel and, and three people trust in Christ in this, in this small gathering. It's like, yeah, this gospel's good. Like, it's not dependent on how good we are or how well we can do. I just preach it, and the Spirit will awaken hearts, and they'll, they'll be changed for eternity. The church proclaims the gospel in light of Jesus' purpose. It sums up what we've already talked about here. We are worshipers, and we are witnesses. We are witnesses. I, just to emphasize, kind of, kind of, press in on this picture that witness is proclamation and the Spirit is in us so that we would speak. Old Testament, you look through these different verses that I put in here and what you'll see is the, well, turn to Acts chapter 2 real quick. Be turning there. I want, I want you to see Acts chapter 2, verse 18. So, yeah, pull out your Bible. Um, when you see these places in the Old Testament, you see the prophets and others, when the Spirit is on them, they speak. The Spirit is on, the Lord is on me to proclaim. That's what the Spirit comes to do. But then you get to Joel chapter 2, and you're turning to Acts chapter 2, so turn there. And you got Joel chapter 2 in here. And, and Peter, Peter's preaching, right? Okay, so Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Peter Stands where they left and lift his voice, address them. He starts to preach, okay? First Christian sermon. And he gets down to verse 16. He says, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And then he starts to quote in verse 17. Now look in your, in your notebook, kind of keep them side by side. In your notebook, you got Joel 2, 28 through 32, which is where he starts quoting from. Now what I want to do is I want us to do a little sermon evaluation of Peter, okay? I, I, I want us to see if he got the quote right. So, it shall come to pass afterward, well, uh, let's see. Well, we'll start with Peter. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. In the last days it shall be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. All right, let's pause for a second. Did he get it right? It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. All right, pretty close. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Okay, you got that right. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Your old men shall dream dreams and young men. So he mixed those up a little bit, but hey, let's give him credit. Like, you know, it's the first Christian sermon. So he mixed them up. Verse 18, he says, Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit. Even on the male and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit. Wait a second. End of verse 18, Peter says, And they shall prophesy. And... In verse 29, in Joel 2, we don't see they shall prophesy. And then he picks up wonders in the heavens above, signs, blood, fire, columns. Okay, so Peter just added a phrase. Bro, you blew it. Like the first Christian sermon, and you missed it. And it is written down for us to talk about for centuries. Or, or what if this is, this is telling us something here? When, when Peter says, they shall prophesy, in those days I'll pour my spirit on my people, and they shall prophesy. Is there a difference between Joel 2 and Acts 2? Think about it with me. In Joel, Old Testament, okay, Old Testament, was everybody a prophet or only a few people prophets? Only a few people prophets, right? 
Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, had the responsibility to proclaim the word of God, right? New Testament. Spirit comes down in Acts chapter 2. I will pour out my spirit on all people. And New Testament, a few people prophets or a lot of people prophets? A lot of people. All, all, all the people who trusted in Christ. Oh, this is good. Do you realize that the privilege that was reserved for Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Joel and a few people like that in the history of the Old Testament is a privilege that every single one of us has in this room. We are prophets. Like, what does that mean? Does that mean we go out with some big orange neon crosses into the city and like turn or burn? No. This means, what does a prophet do? What? What does a prophet do? A prophet speaks for God. And you, every follower of Christ in this room, you have the Spirit of God in you, and he has entrusted you to speak for him. To tell people in Birmingham, whatever city or community you're from, and tell people in the nations, I come with the word of God. Jesus has died on the cross. He has risen from the grave. He has paid the price for sin. Turn and trust in him and be saved. And you can speak with the full authority of God, with the full spirit of God, and see the word bring fruit. Yes, that's the whole purpose. So when you get the New Testament, what I put is eight different passages right here in Luke and Acts. If you remember, Luke wrote both Luke and Acts. Eight different times. You can go back and look at them. You see the phrase, fill with the Spirit, fill with the Spirit, fill with the Spirit. Every single time you see the phrase, fill with the Spirit, is, it is connected with the proclamation of the Word. The Spirit is in us. Yes, He's in us to comfort us. Yes, He's in us to give us gifts. The Spirit's in us to do a lot of different things. Convict us, guide us, lead us. Don't miss it. The Spirit is in you to empower you to speak about Jesus. And so, so this, is, this is the whole purpose of the Spirit in us. Like, oh, God forgive us for the way we have. We've almost tried to go back to an Old Testament picture. Oftentimes with the way we do church, we say, well, the pastor's the preacher. We got a few people who are the speakers, so let's bring them all to hear that person. no. No. Like the way the gospel is going to spread in Birmingham is not by a bunch of people coming into this building to hear it from me. The way the gospel is going to spread in Birmingham is when every member of this faith family, empowered with the Spirit of God, as prophets of God, speaking on behalf of God, scatter throughout the city telling people about the good news of Christ. And the way the gospel is going to go in your community, and the way the gospel is going to go to the nations, is not by a select few pastors or missionaries, show them on video, put them on hologram, if we're really inventive and creative, and they'll do the job. No, you've got every single one of you in this room who knows Christ, you've got the Spirit in you. You've got the Spirit in you, so this is not just for somebody else. God's put you where you work and where you live for a reason, so you're speaking for Him. No, oh, this is how the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. And that's the picture. The church proclaims the gospel in obedience to Jesus' plan. You will be witnesses, Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, the ends of the earth. That is an outline that unfolds over the rest of the book. The gospel in Jerusalem, Acts 6, begins to go to Samaria, Acts chapter 8. Church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace being built up in Acts chapter 9. It's going to, it's in Rome, in the end of Acts chapter 28, going to the ends of the earth. So Old Testament, God had promised his blessing for all nations. That was the picture in the Tower of Babel, all these different languages. And then Genesis chapter 12, God says, Abraham, I'm going to call you out, and you're going to be a blessing to all these different peoples and all these different languages. And the reality is what we see in Acts chapter 2 is that coming, just coming to fruition as all these different languages are here in the gospel proclaimed. and It's going to be proclaimed in every people group. And there's coming a day when every tribe and people in language will gather around his throne and sing his praises because the church is evangelizing. The church is evangelizing. That's what the church does. It tells the good news. Second, the church baptizes. Okay, so, so, so what happens after the good news is proclaimed and people believe and they're called out by God's grace? The church baptizes. Those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And we see this throughout the rest of the book of Acts. They were commanded to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Every single follower of Christ in 
the book of Acts was expected to be baptized. It was part of their identification with Christ. This is the foundation. We've talked about this. We're recipients of a new covenant. And baptism is a declaration that we belong to Jesus. You look back up in, in the Acts 19 and Acts chapter 10, baptized in the name of Christ, in the name of the Lord Jesus. The language is literally identifying with Christ. I love this quote from Stott. It's just simple, but so true. Being a Christian involves a personal, vital identification with Jesus Christ. And this union with him is dramatically set forth in our baptism. This is why I would say to clearly and as bluntly as I can to any follower of Christ in this room who has not been baptized, you are living contrary to the pattern of the New Testament. And this was, this was initial. This wasn't something you grew into. Repent and be baptized. Those who received his word were baptized. And it would make no sense to say, well, I don't want to be baptized. How can you be a Christian and not want to identify with Christ? And especially in light of our brothers and sisters around the world. My first time with house churches in Asia. And I was teaching on baptism and two of the the brothers there, two of the believers, had uh, not been baptized. And they came up to me and they said, we, we've not been baptized. I said, well, okay, well, you need to be baptized. And so they said, okay. And so we arranged it. So these, this house church gathered together and we were about to baptize them. And, and so I had, I had taught them baptism and I thought, okay, I've, I've, I've taught them well on baptism. But I, I learned a lot more in the next couple of minutes. When they brought those two men before the house church, and, and they asked them about their confession of faith, and they shared about their trust in Christ. And they asked them the, both the question, are you willing to be baptized today knowing that it may cost you your life? The first guy, he's a teenager. He said, no matter what it costs, I want to be baptized. Second guy, older guy, he said, I've already sacrificed everything to follow Jesus Christ. I want to be baptized. And so these two guys are baptized. And, uh, we, we don't need to te treat baptism flippantly. This is, this is important. It's our identification with Christ, but not just with Christ. We talked about we're members of a new community, and baptism is a declaration that we belong to each other. I want to show you that baptism is core to what it means to be a part of the church. It's a core function and activity of the church to baptize. It's something that the church does and something that the church is, a body of baptized believers. Now, there's a variety of questions about baptism. We don't have one passage that gives us just a systematic treatment of baptism. So what I want to do is, I'm, I think there's five questions here that I kind of put there that I, I want to just run through and, and say, all right, here, here's what Scripture teaches about baptism. Number one, we follow the example of Christ. Matthew 3, this is what Jesus did. He shows us in a powerful way his identification with us. Even though he had no sin, and baptism was a picture of repentance. So we follow the example of Christ. We obey the command of Christ. Book of Acts, repent and be baptized. It was a command. Jesus says at the end of the book of Matthew, go make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How are you going to do that? And tell others to be baptized if you've not been baptized. How are you going to obey the Great Commission when you're disobedient to what you're going to tell others to do? That would make no sense. It's a contradiction. This is an obedience issue. And third, when we're baptized, we unite with the body of Christ. Look down especially to Ephesians 4. One body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, belongs, one, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now some scholars don't think, don't think that's talking about physical baptism. And maybe it is, maybe it's not. But here's the point. In the Gospels, in, in, in the book of Acts, in all these letters, everybody who followed Christ was baptized. baptized. It wasn't even a question. Like, so it was, it was there. And so, so an, ad, an unbaptized believer is like an oxymoron. Okay, it's like jumbo shrimp. Ba unbaptized believers, like Microsoft works, okay, that doesn't, doesn't. <laughs> no such thing in the New Testament as an unbaptized believers. So that's why we're baptized. Jesus' example, his command, and we unite with the body of Christ. This is the church saying, we see, when somebody's baptized, we see 
This is somebody who's trusted in Christ, and we affirm them, we celebrate with them, and they say, yes, I've trusted in Christ, and I've, I've been called out too. This is good. Why not? What is the meaning of baptism? The meaning of baptism. First, this is key, it's a celebration of the grace of Christ. Romans 6 is the picture of baptism. This is talking about how, how Christ died on the cross as our substitute, and he rose from the grave as our Savior. And this is our identification with him in baptism. It's an illustration of the gospel of Christ. Baptism is a picture. Baptism is not your salvation. It's a picture of your salvation. This is very key. We're called by God's grace through faith in Christ. We are children of God. And we are baptized as children of God. And it's an illustration of the gospel of Christ. When we go into the water, it's a picture of identification with his death. When we come out of the water, it's a picture of participation in his resurrection. Like when you're baptized, you don't go in and like stay underwater. Because Jesus didn't stay in the grave. I, he's out, so you're out. That's, that's the picture that's displayed every time somebody's baptized. It's the gospel. It's a celebration, illustration. It's a proclamation of the glory of Christ. This is Colossians 2, 11. It's just a great picture of how Christ has taken, our way, taken away our sins, made a public spectacle of sin, and triumphed over sin at the cross. It's a declaration in the church and beyond the church. That's the meaning of baptism. How are Christians baptized? Um, now th this is where you, you're going to get different answers in different churches. And I imagine there's probably different answers represented around this room. But the reality is there, there are great heroes of the faith in my own life who we would disagree on these things. And so I, I want to humbly put this before you. I, I think this is uh, certainly, I wouldn't be saying it if I didn't think it was what Scripture is pointing us to. But at the same time, this is one of those places where there's, there's certainly room for, this is not a, an issue over which Christians, well, either you're Christian or not, whether you believe this or not. So I'm convinced the answer, how Christians are baptized, the most biblical mode of baptism is immersion. That the word literally means, baptizo means to emerge, to submerge, to dunk. It's how John got his name, John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, John the Dunker. That's what he did. And, um, you look at this on a few different levels. Precedent of Christ. We saw it in Mar Matthew 3 and Mark 1. He was baptized by John in the Jordan, and he came up out of the water. Not sprinkled, not cup over the head. Like he was, he, he was in the water, and he came up out of the water. The pattern of early church leaders in Acts chapter 8, Ethiopian eunuch. What prevents me from being baptized? Philip doesn't go run down and get a cup and bring it back up. They go down into the water, baptized, they come up out of the water. So picture of the gospel, that's the illustration of the gospel. We identify with Christ in his death, or raised. That's, 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 that's the picture that's there in immersion. I am not claiming to have the corner of truth on this. Um, at the same time, I think there's good biblical precedent to rest here. The biblical mode of baptism is immersion. Um, who should be baptized? Um, this is uh, uh, another area where we would differ some, uh, uh, particularly with, say, Presbyterian brothers and sisters. Um, I believe Scripture clearly teaches that only people, only people who should be baptized includes everyone who has been born again. Key word being again, not just born. That, that's obviously where the distinction would lie. Where, where you put the period is key. Um, again, this is where I have, I have heroes in the faith who have advocated infant baptism on a variety of different bases. And, and I, I don't want to try, uh, I think I could accurately represent the picture of infant baptism. But the reality is that I think the testimony of Scripture is, is clear that that baptism is a declaration that you belong to Christ and that your heart has been changed and regeneration has occurred. I put Colossians 2 there. Even the, the parallels with the old covenant and circumcision that are often used as a basis for why infant baptism is like circumcision in the old covenant and how those relate. I think the reality is old covenant, yes, circumcision followed physical birth into a physical community. Where I think the parallel is, and I think this is what Paul's saying in Colossians 2, New Covenant, baptism follows spiritual birth into a spiritual community. 
that baptism is a reflection of spiritual birth and that happens by the sovereign work of God's grace and the gospel in our hearts. Spiritual regeneration precedes physical immersion. External demonstration follows internal transformation. This is when our hearts have been changed, which obviously cannot happen in an, in an infant. It's our hearts have been changed, and that's when, that's when we are, are baptized. Uh, I do think, obviously, it's, it's good and healthy for parents to say, we want our child to be raised in the nurture and admonition of the gospel and of Christ from the very beginning. Uh, so I wouldn't, wouldn't say that's not healthy, but I do think that we, we confuse the picture of baptism when we don't do it after somebody's trusted in Christ. So when should Christians be baptized? And that's, that's the picture. As soon as they trust in Christ for salvation. In, in, in Acts, and I put all these instances, believers were baptized soon. They were baptized soon. And, and, the, and the picture is, first of all, it's not something you do over and over and over again. And they were baptized, and, and, and then you don't get re-baptized. You get baptized once. If, if, you, were, if you were baptized, quote-unquote, you were immersed or had water poured or anything else, and you were not a follower of Christ, and then and you're immersed later, the reality is you just went for a swim that time. Like, this is baptism. So this is, that's, yeah. So the, the other thing here that I want to add, and, and I know this is totally on shaky turf, and I will admittedly put out there from the very beginning that I don't have a, a scripture necessarily to point you to this. And so that should put all kinds of uh, yellow flags off in, in your mind. And, and so I'll put them out there for you. But I, As soon as, yes, as soon as they trust in Christ for salvation. But I would also add, as soon as we can most wisely testify to our salvation. And here's why I put that. Because I think there's a, I perceive a potential danger in our cultures and cultures like us that are more predominantly Christian. Every instance that we see in the New Testament of baptism, in in all those passages in Acts, Every specific instance that we see involves, involves an adult, maybe, and, and we see household, but we don't see specific ages. But every specific instance involves an adult in a context that was non-Christian, where it was risky to do this. And I think we need to be really careful in our culture and cultures like ours when it comes to children who... In, a, in an area where it is socially, not just socially acceptable, it's socially suggestible, and it's, it's, a, it's a way of gaining approval even in society to be baptized. And, and it's easy, especially in the way we so often do children's so-called evangelism. We use unbiblical terms in it, and, and you can get children to say a variety of different things. And I think it's wise for us to be discerning, for parents and for pastors to be discerning when it comes to a culture where baptism is accepted and common and even, I mean, encouraged and for good reason, but with a child who, who may not yet fully understand the gospel, and that, that's tough to define. I mean, who really fully understands, but has a clear understanding of the gospel and realizes what this means when they're baptized. I just think, I think there's room for some wisdom there. And I think scripture would point us to that kind of wisdom. With this picture of baptism, then we'll, then we'll stop. Uh, think, when you think baptism, think wedding ceremony. I think about the day 10 plus years ago when, when my wife and I, <laughs> when I, when I stood at the front of a building. And you know how it is at weddings in our culture. Like somebody walks out, the groom walks out, everybody's kind of sitting there talking. They look up, they're like, oh, it's the groom. They just kind of go back to talking to each other. <laughs> and so I'm standing there. And a few minutes later, all the music stops. And it gets silent. And these doors in the back open up. And this woman steps into the room. And what does everybody do? Oh, they stand up. 
all turned, they had tears in their eyes, and thinking, I came in five minutes ago, what's the deal? <laughs> and I'll never forget the moment when I saw her face and, and just realized, yes, she's mine. And, and this is the picture. And, and a whole host of people there to say, yes, she's yours. Like it was testifying to everybody. She's mine. And this is what baptism is. It's a picture. It's a public picture designed to be a public picture. It's not a private thing. It's the church baptizes. Church baptizes because this is, this is the church saying, yes, he belongs to Christ. She belongs to Christ. And it's you saying, yes, I belong to Christ. It's mine. I'm identified with his death. I'm dead to sin. And I'm identified with his life, his resurrection. I'm alive in him. And the church celebrates it together. Like, why would we not make that a priority in the church? That's good. We need to do this. That's why it's, it's a non-negotiable, essential function activity of the church.